this time on Crime Inc. Beetle George Harrison's horrifying ordeal. The tragic delusions of Heaven's Gate. George Best, fall of a legend. A silent screen star's murder trial. And the Sharpville Massacre. But first, the terrifying tale of the Yorkshire Ripper. Nighttime in Northern England in the late 1970s, a dangerous time for women. From 1975 to 1980, 13 women were murdered by the depraved man who came to be dubbed the Yorkshire Ripper. Four of the five first victims were prostitutes, leading to some complacency in the general community. But on the 25th of June, 1977, 16-year-old supermarket worker Jane McDonald was murdered in Chapeltown, a crime that struck fear into the heart of every woman living in the city. The Ripper would take his victims by surprise, bludgeoning them in the head with a hammer, then slashing them across the stomach and back with a knife before sexually assaulting them. Huge resources were poured into the police investigation, but the massive amounts of information being generated also proved to be its undoing. With more than 10,000 possible leads filed on index cards, police did not have an effective way of cross-checking information. Police conducted thousands of interviews. One man dragged into the net was an apparently mild-mannered lorry driver, Peter Sutcliffe. But the interviews brought forward no new information and Sutcliffe was never regarded as a serious suspect. Surviving victim Maureen Long was attacked and left for dead just two weeks after Jane McDonald was murdered. The trauma of the assault was so great, she suffered partial amnesia and was unable to give police an accurate description of her assailant. However, on the 2nd of January, 1981, police got a break when they arrested Sutcliffe for driving a car with false number plates. Because he was in the car with a prostitute and he fitted many of the characteristics of the killer, including a gap between his front teeth, Sutcliffe was held for questioning. Police realized they might finally have the right man when they discovered a knife hidden in the police station toilet and a hammer and rope at the scene of his arrest. Confronted with this evidence, Sutcliffe calmly confessed to the murders. In court, he pleaded not guilty to murder on the grounds of insanity, claiming, God invested me with the means to kill prostitutes. Perhaps he's just put me in jail to give me a rest. The prostitutes are still there, and my mission is only partially fulfilled. Perhaps another is ready to take my place. But the prosecution revealed that he told his wife, Sonia, I did it all. I expect 30 years in prison, but if I convince people I'm mad, I will only do 10 years in the loony bin. Sutcliffe's family was shattered. You had to come to terms with the fact that your son is the Yorkshire Ripper. Oh, naturally, we had to come to terms with that, yes. And it's been a dreadful, traumatic thing to have to do. Sutcliffe was found guilty on all counts and sentenced to life in prison. He was later diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic and transferred to a secure psychiatric facility. It's unlikely he'll ever be released. When they traveled the world in the early days of their career, the greatest threat facing the Beatles was hysterical girls. The Fab Four continued to grow in popularity, and when they disbanded in 1970, the Beatles were undoubtedly the most popular band in the world. But their fame had a deadly downside. In 1980, a deranged fan seeking attention shot John Lennon dead outside his New York apartment, plunging the world into mourning. The other Beatles took heed and upped their security. George Harrison released a statement that said, to rob someone of life is the ultimate robbery. He eventually invested in a heavily fortified 100-room mansion at Henley-on-Thames in Oxfordshire, England. But George's security is not just for his personal safety, which obviously worries all famous people. It was, he wanted to be secure for his privacy. But despite extensive precautions, Harrison and his wife Olivia came close to death when an intruder attacked them on New Year's Eve 1999. It seemed all the money in the world couldn't buy peace of mind. 
Well, it's not that long ago since somebody actually got into the Queen's bedroom. And I think if somebody is determined enough, uh, it doesn't matter how grand you are or how much money you spend on security, eventually that person will find their way underneath your guard. Assailant Michael Abrams was mentally ill and believed he was possessed by Harrison and had been given a mission from God to kill the famous musician. He used part of a stone sword broken from a statue of St. George and the Dragon in the couple's garden to smash a window and stabbed Harrison with a knife when he tried to protect his wife. Despite suffering severe wounds, including a punctured lung, Harrison helped secure Abrams until police arrived. The couple was taken to nearby Royal Berkshire Hospital. The chest is full of main blood vessels and arteries, and, and the lungs are full of main blood vessels as well. So, as I say, it is just by chance that it wasn't more serious. Harrison quipped that although he realized the man wasn't a burglar, he certainly wasn't auditioning for Harrison's band, the Traveling Wilburys. Who, who knows? It could be a number of things. It could be an obsessive fan, could be somebody who simply didn't like him. Uh, I don't know. When the matter went to court the following year, Harrison read a statement to court describing how he could taste blood in his mouth and heard his lung deflate as Abram plunged the knife into his chest. There was a time during this violent struggle that I truly believed I was dying, he said. Abrams was acquitted on the grounds of insanity and was admitted to a psychiatric institution for an indefinite period. Harrison became a virtual recluse until his death from cancer just a year later. On March the 26th, 1997, a flotilla of news crews descended on the affluent Californian community of Rancho Santa Fe near San Diego. They were responding to the disturbing news that 38 people had been found dead in an apparent group suicide. Police discovered that the dead were members of the Heaven's Gate organization, a religious cult led by 65-year-old Marshall Applewaite, who was also found dead at the mansion. Laid out neatly on bunk beds, the bodies were dressed in identical clothing, including brand new black and white Nike tennis shoes and armband patches reading Heaven's Gate Away Team. A square purple cloth covered their faces, the death scene had been cleaned up and photographed by a cult member who didn't go through with a suicide. Investigations revealed that Applewaite had convinced the group that a UFO was hidden behind the hale Bop comet, which could be seen from Earth at the time, and that by committing suicide, their souls would be recycled into a new existence and taken away by the spaceship to another world. Applewaite had a history of mental illness his acolytes believed he was the second coming of Jesus Christ. Sadly, they paid the ultimate price for their delusions. Coming up, a vintage Hollywood mystery. George Best was one of the greatest footballers of the 20th century, a player whose speed, balance, and goal scoring thrilled the nation again and again. His fellow Irishman cheekily summed up his position in the footballing world as Maradona good, Pele better, George Best. But like so many with phenomenal talent, Best had equally powerful demons. In his case, a chronic alcoholism that led to his premature death at the age of 59 in November 2005. His dependence on drink also resulted in a very public fall from grace. At the height of his career, Bess reveled in the opportunities presented to him by his stratospheric fame. Dubbed the fifth Beatle because of his mop of hair, football's pinup boy parted long and hard. I spent a lot of my money on booze, birds, and fast cars, he once said. The rest I squandered. At one plush hotel, a valet recalled finding him in bed with the current Miss Universe and 20,000 pounds in cash scattered over the bedclothes. The man himself said of his many conquests, I went missing quite a lot. Miss England, Miss Wales, Miss World. But as the swinging 60s receded, so did Best's footballing career. 
In 1970, at the age of only 25, one of the greatest talents the footballing world has ever seen was on a downward spiral, fueled by constant drinking binges. They led to a conviction and three-month jail term for drink driving and assaulting a police officer in 1984. But while Best was mortified at going to jail, Ford Open Prison had no complaints, scoring an impressive player for their football team. Best's wife at the time, former Playboy bunny Angela McDonald James, stood by him, but the marriage ended shortly afterwards. In an interview following his release from prison, Best was both repentant and defensive. I did something that was wrong, and I had to, I had to pay for it. I think I was a little bit, honestly, a little bit heavy. Uh, but, uh, as I say, not a very pleasant experience, but it's all behind me now. It's, it's over and done with, and, and hopefully uh, I'd like to think I've learned a little bit from it. You really are a case of the soccer idol who's fallen from grace and become a public nuisance, even a bore. Do you really think you can mend your ways this time? All my problems have been drink-related, and uh, if I can stay off that, there's no reason. I'm very, very busy still. I mean, and I'm fed up reading this rubbish about me being a fallen idol, as if I'm lying in the gutter and I don't work. I earn more today than any other footballer in England. But Best was declared bankrupt just a few years later. His drinking worsened, and in 2002, his long-abused liver was replaced in a successful transplant. But amid much controversy, Best failed to mend his ways and was back in court two years later on a drink-driving charge. He was banned from driving for 20 months, but before the sentence could be completed, Best was dead from a kidney infection. At his request, the News of the World publish a photo of him in hospital just before his death with the comment, don't die like me, reportedly a warning to others of the dangers of alcohol abuse. It was the murder trial of the 20s. One of the silent screen's greatest stars charged with raping and murdering a beautiful young starlet. But behind the sensational newspaper headlines was one of the greatest injustices of the early 20th century. Funny man Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle was the darling of audiences around the world. Large in girth, but light in step, his physical comedy had people chuckling from the earliest days of film. His rise was so rapid that by 1918, he accepted a three-year, $3 million contract for Paramount Pictures. Arbuckle put in punishing hours to fulfill his contract, and by September 1921, he was burnt out from performing in three feature films simultaneously. He took a weekend off with two good friends, actor-director Lyle Sherman and cameraman Fred Fishback, and traveled to San Francisco for some R&R. &R. The men decided to throw a party in their suite at the St. Francis Hotel. They invited several women, including aspiring actress Virginia Repe, Four days later, Repe was dead, and Arbuckle was charged with her murder. The prosecution alleged that Arbuckle pierced Repe's bladder with an external object while having sex with her, causing her to die from peritonitis. But their entire case was based on the testimony of one particularly unreliable witness, a known blackmailer and procurer, Maud Delmont. As it turned out, Delmont's speciality was providing girls for Hollywood parties and setting them up to cry rape. Miss Delmont would then take cash from the patsy in return for her silence. Unfortunately for Arbuckle, the lead prosecutor, District Attorney Matthew Brady, wasn't going to let a little thing like justice get in the way of a spectacular show trial. Putting one of the world's most famous comedians on trial for such a salacious crime was going to give the aspiring politician the sort of publicity that money can't buy. Media magnate William Randolph Hearst was equally expectant. He set his stable of prurient tabloids onto Arbuckle, ordering a character assassination of such savagery that even after Arbuckle was completely exonerated, most Americans still believed him to be guilty. Hearst later boasted, that the Arbuckle scandal sold more newspapers than the sinking of the Lusitania. Producer Adolf Zucker bankrolled Arbuckle's defense, but most of the studios banned Arbuckle's colleagues from testifying on his behalf in case it tainted their own careers. Arbuckle's account of the evening in question was simple and believable. 
and backed up by most people at the party. He went to his room to change his clothes and found Virginia Rappe vomiting in the toilet. Thinking she was drunk, he helped her clean up and settled her in a bed so she could sleep it off. Arbuckle and others at the party later found her tearing at her clothes in great discomfort. They called hotel management who settled her in her own room. She wasn't taken to hospital until three days later because everyone assumed her problems were caused by alcohol. The following day, she died from peritonitis, caused by a ruptured bladder. After the defense presented a letter detailing Delmont's plans to extort Arbuckle and listed her many convictions for racketeering, bigamy, fraud and extortion, the judge threw out the rape charge, but he held Arbuckle could go to trial for manslaughter. When the case came to court, the first trial was declared a mistrial after the jury was unable to agree on a verdict. The second saw the same evidence presented with the addition of a new testimony from a prosecution witness who revealed that the district attorney had forced her to lie. But still the jury was unable to come to an agreement and the matter was forced to go back to the court. At the third time, it took the jury just six minutes to return a verdict of not guilty. They also read a statement of apology to the actor, saying they hoped the American people would accept their judgment that Roscoe Arbuckle is entirely innocent and free from all blame. Sadly, that wasn't enough to resurrect Arbuckle's career. The public had turned against him. Cinemas blacklisted his films, and he began to spiral into alcoholism. Arbuckle died of a heart attack in 1933, aged just 46, a broken, and forgotten man. moment when the brutal reality of South Africa's apartheid regime was laid bare to the world. 69 bodies lay scattered around the township of Sharpville, slaughtered by white South African police. The Sharpville massacre occurred on March the 21st, 1960, when police opened fire on a crowd of unarmed black protesters. The men, women and children were protesting against the white government's pass laws, which were being used to enforce racial segregation. Several thousand people congregated at the Sharpville police station, offering themselves for arrest for not carrying their passbooks, a peaceful but creative ruse to attract publicity to their cause. But the scene turned ugly and police panicked, barricading themselves behind a four-foot wire mesh fence. Reinforcements were called in, including fighter jets and armored cars that attempted to scatter the crowd. Police commander G.D. Pinar later denied that he gave any order to fire. But shortly after the crowd reacted violently to police attempts to arrest a protester, police in the compound opened fire almost simultaneously with revolvers, rifles and sten guns. Just two minutes of shooting produced the shocking images that were broadcast to the world. More than 200 injured people flooded the local hospital. So many transfusions were needed that day that the blood bank ran out of stocks of black African blood and had to start using supplies donated by white Africans. The Sharpville massacre shocked South Africans and enraged the world. Demonstrators marched through the streets of London to mourn the dead and assembled outside South Africa House shouting, murder. But the South African government, led by Prime Minister H.F. Vervoord, dug its heels in, despite finding itself isolated and besieged. On the 9th of April, Vervoord was the target of an assassination attempt when white anti-apartheid activist David Pratt shot him in the face. Vervoord survived against all odds and was back in the saddle less than two months later, still unrepentant about the system of apartheid. Oh. Policy is one which is called by an Afrikaans word apartheid. And I'm afraid that has been misunderstood so often. It could just as easily and perhaps much better be described as a policy of good neighborliness. 
But South Africa's fellow Commonwealth states did not agree that stripping people of their citizenship because of the color of their skin and providing them with inferior health, education, and employment conditions to their white brothers and sisters was a particularly neighborly policy. South Africa became a republic in 1961, which meant it had to reapply to join the Commonwealth. Verbord was persuaded to withdraw his application when it became apparent a majority of states were going to blackball South Africa. The country remained a pariah state until apartheid was removed from the statute books in the 1990s. In 1998, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission found that the authorities in charge at Sharpeville were directly responsible for gross human rights violations by using excessive force thus closing the books on one of South Africa's most shameful events. With the sun casting long shadows in a Caracas cemetery, the Venezuelan priest puffs a cigar and mumbles a few words about the life of Ishmael, a dead thief at the center of a strange cult devoted to criminals. Devotees of the Corte Melanger, or Gangster's Pantheon, say the spirits of gangsters who once maintained a reign of terror in Caracas now provide protection against violent crime in a city where murders and robberies are rife. The Gangster's Pantheon takes as its symbol a hawk on a motorcycle, one of Ishmael's tattoos, to honor him. The principal saint from the gangster's pantheon is called Ishmael Quintana. All the others follow him. They're named Isabelita, Ratun, and Miguelito. And there are a lot more. These notorious criminals once preyed on poor hillside neighborhoods. But believers in the court of Melandra say the spirits of the dead criminals are trying to make amends for their villainous past by protecting people and helping those who might be tempted into crime. When Ishmael was alive, he lived in Batari. He was a criminal who robbed. He robbed the people with money, and he gave the money to those who had none. He was like a kind of Robin Hood. Nina became a follower after spending four months in intensive care with a gunshot wound. She spends her days selling candles to offer at the tombs of Ishmael, the rat, and Isabelita in South Caracas General Cemetery. She says she has seen pensioners, army generals, and even high-ranking police officers paying their respects at the tombs. 60% of the people who live here are older. Mothers who have children with problems, drug addiction. They have children who are in jail. They do drugs. They have problems with the law. So they come here to ask the saints to solve their problems. The villain's pantheon is part of the Maria Leonza cult. And not all followers of the goddess Maria Leonza believe that the villain's pantheon has a place. What type of dark energy can come from this? We don't sell any of that stuff, and we don't use it either. That would put us in touch with really bad vibes. Asesinos, ladrones... These people are killers, criminals. Whenever you ask for their help, what kind of things might happen? But the cult remains popular with many people and has even spread as far as Cuba and Spain. Police conducted thousands of interviews, 
One man dragged into the net was an apparently mild-mannered lorry driver, Peter Sutcliffe. But the interviews brought forward no new information, and Sutcliffe was never regarded as a serious suspect. Surviving victim Maureen Long was attacked and left for dead just two weeks after Jane MacDonald was murdered. The trauma of the assault was so great, she suffered partial amnesia and was unable to give police an accurate description of her assailant. However, on the 2nd of January, 1981, police got a break when they arrested Sutcliffe for driving a car with false numbers. This time on Crime Inc. Beetle George Harrison's horrifying ordeal. The tragic delusions of Heaven's Gate. But on the 25th of June, 1977, 16-year-old supermarket worker Jane McDonald was murdered in Chapeltown, a crime that struck fear into the heart of every woman living in the city. The Ripper would take his victims by surprise, bludgeoning them in the head with a hammer then slashing them across the stomach and back with a knife before sexually assaulting them. Huge resources were poured into the police investigation, but the massive amounts of information being generated also proved to be its undoing. With more than 10,000 possible leads filed on index cards, police did not have an effective way of cross-checking information. George Best, fall of a legend. A silent screen star's murder trial and the Sharpeville Massacre. But first, the terrifying tale of the Yorkshire Ripper. Nighttime in Northern England in the late 1970s, a dangerous time for women. From 1975 to 1980, 13 women were murdered by the depraved man who came to be dubbed the Yorkshire Ripper. Four of the five first victims were prostitutes, leading to some complacency in the general community on the plates. Because he was in the car with a prostitute and he fitted many of the characteristics of the killer, including a gap between his front teeth, Sutcliffe was held for questioning. Police realized they might finally have the right man when they discovered a knife hidden in the police station toilet and a hammer and rope at the scene of his arrest. Confronted with this evidence, Sutcliffe calmly confessed to the murders. In court, he pleaded not guilty to murder on the grounds of insanity, claiming, God invested me with the means to kill prostitutes. Perhaps he's just put me in jail to give me a rest. The prostitutes are still there, and my mission is only partially fulfilled. Perhaps